Good morning. You're waking up to Art and Diab. It is Tuesday, the 6th of December. The 6th. How many days? 19 more days to Santi. That's it, 19 <laughs> days. 19, we're on the official countdown. Now, first up this morning, demand for taxis is on the rise for the festive season, but driver shortages are putting a strain on the sector. We'll be discussing this at 7.15. I think I'm just staying in suburbs. I'm not going to yeah. town. Lots of people are going to that. That's going to affect all the bars in town as well. Yeah. And shops. People will be bringing them home, people to their houses rather than having to yeah. quiet. We'd love to hear from you on that. Of course, later on, the Emmy-nominated producer who has penned a gripping new book detailing how billionaire Sean Quinn went bankrupt and lost his empire. Now, star of festive feel-good film Love Actually, Martine McCutcheon. She's going to be chatting to us after nine this morning. Looking forward to that. Yeah, plus it's time for the Christmas clear-out. Do you do that? No. Absolutely. Of course he doesn't. He's got too many rooms in his house. He doesn't need to clear it out. Uh, we're getting tips on decluttering to make way for the decorations. Good it's morning, Derek. Where are you in the world are you this morning? Yes, good morning, Al. We're live up here in Monaghan this morning, just up north. It's a very cold, quite a frosty start, but some really nice December sunshine on the cards out there today, but a very, very chilly night in store later on tonight. But as you can see, just over my shoulder, guys, we're live here at Chuck Nadini. It's the Family Resort Centre here, just outside Monaghan Town. We're going to be catching up with some of the volunteers here a little bit later on, talking about their uh, partnership with the Tesco Christmas Appeal. But can we talk about those temperatures? I'm just back off a of flight for the Canary Isles. I was over doing uh, a race over there. Big shout out to everyone. Rahidi, Ronnie Club. We met them all at the weekend. Uh, but it's supposed to be very, very cold out there tonight. Back to about minus three, even minus four degrees. <laughs> it's chilly. <laughs> chilly one, chilly one all week, seemingly. Maybe yeah. two, maybe two. Uh, right now, it's time to go over to the Virgin Media News Hub. Here is Ashling Roach. Thanks, Marin. Good morning. A man has died after one of two separate shootings in Dublin last night. Gardaí were called to the Ronanstown area of Dublin 22 at around 10pm where a man had been shot and was later pronounced dead at the scene. Separately, Gardaí are investigating a shooting that happened at around 9 o'clock in the Finglas area. One man has been taken to hospital with injuries which are not believed to be life-threatening. Forecasters say that temperatures are set to drop in the coming days. An Arctic air mass is due to set in towards the end of this week, bringing severe frost and icy patches on roads. It's expected the cold snap will bring some light falls of snow, hail and sleet. Speaking on The Tonight Show, Alan O'Reilly from Carlo Weather says a storm in the Atlantic is expected to deepen and move towards the country, bringing sustained cold conditions. We could stay in a very cold air mass right into next week. And really, there is a risk now that this could continue for two weeks. So we would see temperatures staying below normal for two weeks. Uh, and there is some other options which, you know, are low risk at this stage. But we could see the potential for that storm to track up and meet the cold air and fall as snow as well. So it's really hard to say what exactly is going to be the details around that, but certainly a risk of a very cold spell. So people should be prepared for at least seven to ten days of cold weather and possibly four. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says the country is switching to emergency shutdowns to stabilize its power grid after Russian missile attacks. He said many regions were affected and local authorities warned that around half of the Kyiv region would remain without electricity in the coming days. Overnight, more missiles hit critical infrastructure and residential houses. Ukraine is now seeing sub-zero temperatures in many regions. At least 34 people have died after a landslide in Colombia. The falling mud buried a bus and two other vehicles, leaving many people trapped. Several more people were rescued and taken to hospital. According to Colombia's National Emergency Management Agency, the town had been under a mudslide threat due to heavy rains. Rescue efforts are continuing in Indonesia after Mount Semeru erupted, sending ash billowing into the sky and sparking evacuations on the country's main island, Java. Authorities raised the volcano's warning status to the highest level. Improved weather conditions show the scale of the damage after Mount Semeru erupted at the weekend. A mandatory evacuation order affecting thousands of residents is now being put in place, with a no-go area of 17 kilometres in force around the volcano and a search for any possible victims underway. Mount Simaru, the highest volcano on Indonesia's most densely populated island, erupted on Sunday following heavy monsoon rain. It's based around 640 kilometres southeast of the capital, Jakarta. Ash and debris has covered local villages completely, 
causing thousands to leave their homes, with many people choosing to take all their belongings and livestock. The heavy debris also destroyed a bridge that had just been rebuilt after last year's deadly eruption, which killed 51 people. Many were rehomed at that time, but thousands continue to live on the hill near the summit. While the eruption has now slowed, thousands of residents remain on high alert. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. Meanwhile, in Hawaii, the Mauna Loa volcano is still erupting over one week since it began. A steady stream of lava is still flowing down a hill from the world's largest active volcano. The lava rivers are on track to reach a busy motorway on the island. Actress Kirstie Alley, best known for her role in the comedy series Cheers, has died of cancer at the age of 71. She won an Emmy Award for her role on the popular TV series. Alley also appeared in many films, including Star Trek, Drop Dead Gorgeous and Look Who's Talking. A statement from her children said their incredible, fierce and loving mother had passed away. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you, Anne Marie. And a very good morning to you at home if uh, you're indeed streaming online on the player as well. We're coming to you live here from Monaghan Town this morning. We've got Shock to Dini Family Resource Centre just over my shoulder, and we're going to be catching up with some of the local volunteers here doing fantastic work in the local community. So that's all to come right across the morning. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together now with Ushi Morn on cameras. And I have to say, it's a very, very cold start up here in Monaghan Town this morning. Uh, we are seeing showers through parts of Clarenton North Tip and uh, many parts of North County Dublin not escaping either but elsewhere mainly dry and settled now still under the cover of darkness for the next wee while in those light to moderate northerly winds. Now right across the day in fact once uh, it does brighten up a pretty decent day in store uh, some really nice December sunshine on the cards now will cloud up for a time uh, through southern and eastern parts through the southeastern corner that's where we could see a couple of showers later on today, but as we're holding out uh, with some nice, uh, uh, some nice uh, December rays on the cards. Top valleys of about four to eight degrees, and finally, then tonight mainly dry and settled. We will see patchy mist and fog, a taster of that across the southern half of the country. Elsewhere, widespread. We could see a sharp to severe ground frost set in with wintry showers then through hilly and higher ground in across the northwest later on tonight into tomorrow morning. But all eyes really on those temperatures over the next uh, 12 to 24 hours with valleys uh, overnight lows tonight back to minus 3 to plus 1 degrees. So very, very chilly one ahead. Anyway, that's how we're shaping up here in Monaghan Town at the moment with Catskin back live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a now, if you've been out on a night lately, then chances are you'll know all about oh, the taxi driver shortage. Yeah. And I mean everywhere in the country. Oh, yeah. Not just Dublin or Limerick. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, get in touch about this because we're going to be chatting about it after the break. Thanks for staying with us. Now, it's not looking good for passengers or drivers with the current taxi shortage set to continue over the festive season. And we'd love to talk to you about this because uh, I was recently out in mid Kerry and it was unreal. Like, there was four taxis for an entire area of mid Kerry, Four to six, if we were lucky. So, like, what are people meant to do? Yeah. Uh, is it just you're going you're going to stay at home? And this has knock-on effects for hospitality, of course. 89 6 111 Joining us to discuss the reasons for the shortage is Uber Ireland General Manager Kieran Hart and Vinnie Curran, CEO of NXT Taxis. Thank you so much for being here with us, Kieran. Why, why don't we have any taxi drivers? Well, I think the big challenge for the industry is just the number of vehicles vehicles and taxis in the industry. We've seen that falling for the past 10 years. So we would have had around 27,000 vehicles in the industry. We're now down to about 19,000. So that's really challenging just for the growing number of people who are actually using apps like Uber to actually engage with the industry. Mm -hmm. More and more people are using their smartphones to book themselves a taxi. Um, and in other comparable markets around the world, we're actually seeing the number of taxis grow. So Ireland's in a really unique 
an unfortunate position. But it's going down. Yeah. And Vinny, the National Transport Authorities have been trying to do these ads and trying to get people interested in it. But in the last campaign, they said it was very successful. But I think there was only an increase of about 60, 60 drivers. Yes, I think the latest stats uh, say that the, they have 900 new uh, license holders. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually out there driving taxis. A lot of these people will be people who will gain a license to have it there in case they lose their own job. So really, we've had a, a huge exodus from the industry post-COVID. Uh, an awful lot of drivers found it difficult to maintain payments on cars and insurance through COVID. And they sought work elsewhere. They found that quite comfortable and they haven't returned to the industry. And that that's and that's the thing. Like I know like taxi drivers who have gone in, they became de delivery drivers during COVID and they've kept that up nine to five working yeah. hours, you know, better pay for an awful lot of people. You can't be guaranteed mm -hmm. an income when you're a taxi driver. So from that regard, Vinny, how do you recruit when there are so many other jobs out there? Well, first of all, statistically, Dublin has more taxis per head population than most of our comparable cities. But it's just, uh, we're one of the few cities whereby uh, we, uh, after midnight, uh, we're one of the cities that taxis are mainly your only choice of transport. Yeah. Very difficult to get a bus, a dar to Lewis. Um, and uh, I think that's where the problem lies. If you go to any other major city, they have buses running right through the night. They have uh, underground, they have overhead and, and all of these working together. Uh, will help. And I, I think we can address this, but we need to plan now for next year. It, it's pointless really talking about a solution at this stage for Christmas. I was in town myself last weekend and uh, the amount of people partying was just unbelievable. And it's down to also people not having been out for the last couple of years. At Christmas time, yeah, and that they want to get out and enjoy it this year. Kieran, are you seeing the problem like that in recruiting people? We do, but we also say it's not just a Dublin thing. This is right across the country. Yeah, right the across country. the country, yeah. And what we need to be doing is looking at ways of bringing new drivers into the industry. And that, that is something we are doing really, really well in other markets. So, um, But how do we do it here? Well, I think from speaking to drivers, there's the will and the intent of drivers to want to join the industry. We have a lot coming to us to the website and looking to sign up. What they say to us, the biggest challenges for them is that there's a really small number of vehicles which you need to get licensed to join the industry at the moment. And most of those, most of the people wanting to join the industry own vehicles, mm -hmm. but they're not the right vehicles to get licensed. So broadening the criteria for vehicles will open up the industry to a lot more people. Sorry, I don't understand that. What do you mean the light, there's only a certain amount of vehicles that can be licensed? So if you wanted to, to become a, a brand new taxi driver today, you would need to either get a vehicle like a Peugeot Partner or a Volkswagen Caddy, like very specific makes and models of vehicles. So they're wheelchair accessible? So they would need to be able to be modified to be wheelchair, wheelchair accessible. Wheelchair accessible, so yeah. that's one thing that, that has to be within the industry here. Um, Is also, that a new law that came in? That's been around it's since been around. 2013, which is where we started to see the number of vehicles and the, and the industry shrink. So you're saying that that is, people just don't want to do that. They don't want to have cars that are wheel Because most taxis that you see, and obviously that's one thing, like we can't exclude people from getting taxis if they're not wheelchair accessible. No, absolutely. And, and the, the single best thing we could do to improve accessibility for wheelchair users is to increase the overall number of taxis on the road. Mm. With the current taxi shortage, what we're seeing is that people who require a wheelchair service are actually struggling to find the appropriate car because those cars are already booked out in high demand by people who don't have that same requirement to, to require a wheelchair car. Right, so you don't think this is working for us. If you're a wheelchair user, we'd love to we'd love to hear from you this morning in relation to this. Is this an issue that you have? 0896 111 So you're saying we need to you want to widen it to, so like any saloon car can become a taxi. Because there are issues there. You have to change your car uh, every few years, you have to have constant NCTs when you are a taxi driver and that's something that they give out about. But what about in relation to safety? Like, are there issues with taxi drivers going, it's not worth it. I, I don't know who's going to turn into my cab at night, like if people are going to be puking all over it. Like, is that is that an issue as well? We certainly hear that. But this is where in other markets, um, transportation apps like Uber are actually bringing in new cohorts of drivers because it raises the bar in safety. So it's drivers who don't necessarily want to do taxiing work and picking up from ranks or streets, 
they only want to look at doing pre-book trips. And that's because they know that the passenger has been vetted, there's a credit card on okay, file. OK, there's a credit card on file, yeah. And they know like that. that all the, tri the trips are GPS tracked. But then there's also then... always going to be an issue in city centres then, because that's not going to happen that's... at night time at 3 o'clock in the morning, where you've got issues of cars not stopping for people because they have card, or they're not stopping for people because they look, oh, just, you're not going far enough for me. That's something we hear all but of the time. But that happens, Maren. The, time, the amount of times I've tried to get into a taxi and they'd ask where you're going, they say, sorry, and they just drive off. And what we're seeing in other markets is it's, it's a mixture of cars. It's not just taxi. It's taxis, it's hackneys, it's limousines. So, again, it's about how do we grow the entire industry so that we are finding the right solutions for the right people. And, Vinny, are you yeah. hearing that as well? You know, because we do see it all of the time on social media where it's young women going, a taxi just wouldn't stop for me, I wasn't going far enough for them. There are issues of safety here in relation to people. But, of course, taxi drivers are like, well, the onus isn't on me for that. They've got to make sure they can get their own way home. It's not our fault. Well, first of all, uh, to, to refuse a fare on the basis of it's not going the right direction for you is actually illegal. And if, if somebody but takes down the route... It's number, done. They're doing it all the time. I'm proof of it and, yes, and all my friends I are proof of it. I'm absolutely aware it's happening every night of the week, but I'm saying it is illegal. That's an enforcement issue. But I, I think it's more complex. The whole issue of getting new drivers into the industry is more complex. First of all, uh, the time it takes to get entry into the profession. In, in the UK, for instance, you could become a, a taxi driver in an average of four to six weeks. In Ireland, it takes an average four to six months. Now, if somebody has lost their job, they're not going to wait around four to six months to get a license to drive a taxi. They're going to take up other employment in a buoyant economy, in an economy where they can get jobs left, right and centre. So really, we've, if we streamlined entry into the profession and looking at the vehicle choice, there are... The NTA, in their wisdom, made a decision that all new taxis would be wheelchair accessible. But anybody can go and get a new licence tomorrow. And there are a variety of, uh, of, of models and makes available. And they're available every day of the week. But the cost of entry is pretty high because the average... Oh, I think oh, we, we may have just, uh, just Finney. We've just lost just him there. Lost there. At that lovely shot for him that he just, <laughs> I'm sure he'll be really appreciative of with that one. Of course, the entry levels that it takes people to get in there are safety there and guard the vetting, and that's what yeah. we do in this country. Listen, um, we'd love to hear from you on this one. Kieran Hart, General Manager of Uber Ireland, and Vinnie Kearns, who was just there with us a minute ago, Chief Executive of NXT Taxis. He's back to normal, back, I think. Back to normal, but thank you thank both you for both joining so us. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks very much for having it me. Is, it is something that we are going to continue to hear right through the Christmas period, but thank you for joining us. Kieran, you're getting it? the car? I am. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. He'll be at home. He'll be at home. Uh -huh. We'd love to hear from you on this. Now, a new survey has found that half of under 30s are considering emigrating due to the cost of living crisis here. In the... And the great news just keeps on coming, oh, yeah. doesn't it? We're going to be discussing that and all today's top stories next. Now it's time to take a look at today's front pages. We're going to start with the Irish Times. House prices set to rise despite slowdown in market. A major lobby group has warned that structural issues are set to keep pushing demand for homes higher despite the recent slowdown in the property market. Population growing at three times the rate of home supply. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Population growth far in excess of new housing is creating pent-up demand that won't be relieved until supply increases substantially, according to a new banking report. The examiner leads with Healthy Ireland. We drink more, but we smoke less. The report finds that we're drinking more, but smoking less, possibly getting fatter. And some of us are struggling to afford basic healthcare products, such as tampons. The mirror goes with minus seven killer chiller. Ireland is bracing itself for minus seven degrees Celsius temperatures with Med Aaron saying the icy blast could last until next week. The star's headline, you'll catch your debt. Elderly people are being urged to keep the heating on and not to worry about the bills ahead of the cold snap. The Sun's front page reads, Dowdall's wife I feared hit. Jonathan Dowdall's wife was afraid He'd be killed for speaking to Gardy about the Regency hit a court has heard. The Herald goes with gangsters on CCTV with bag after Keane murder. A Drogheda criminal and Dublin hitman were spotted near the Keane Mulready Woods murder scene with a sports bag after the teenager's killing. And finally, half of under 30s are thinking of emigrating is the top story in the Daily Mail. More than half of young people under 30 say they would consider leaving the country due to the spiralling 
costs of living here. And very cheery. Very cheery. It's lovely and cheery. News Talks, Anton Savage, cheery. It's very cheery. Very cheery. And that's cheery what we're going to start day. with. Half of under 30s are thinking of emigrating in this survey. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny if you stitch together all of the front pages of the papers yes. today because there's, there's a weird <clears throat> paradox in a lot of it. On the one hand, we're being told that um, half of under 30s are considering emigrating. On the other hand, we're being told that the population is rising by 160,000 people over the last three years mm -hmm. and is set to grow more. Mm -hmm. So we have vast net immigration with a younger population talking about the possibility of emigration, <laughs> which is slightly counterintuitive. Yeah. What it boils down to is any time you say emigration in Ireland, I think there is a knee-jerk response that we all think famine or 1950s or 80s recession and people are being forced out of the country. We're not quite there. We are at a situation where people see op economic opportunity elsewhere, elsewhere rather than economic yeah. necessity because the economic necessity is what is bringing people yeah. into the country and we need them to keep doing it. Why are people considering, and this is only considering, when I asked in a survey, would you, they said maybe. It's not the same as my bags are packed and I'm ready yeah, to go. Yeah, that's true. But when asked about it, the reason is what we would all know. Cost of living is going through the mm -hmm. roof. And housing is a huge problem. Yeah. And that brings us, of course, to the other front page story, which is housing starts and housing prices, because the BPFI have come out and said, you know the way it looked like the rate of housing price increase was reducing yep. slightly? Well, don't start counting your chickens because we are still expecting to see a house price increase into the coming years because we're just, as we know, I mean, how many times can we beat this drum? We're just not building housing fast No, enough. even though Dara O'Brien says they're on target and they're, they're building more than they ever have before. Do you know what struck me in this is that 29% said that they were afraid that they couldn't afford to start a family. Correct. And that's just really sad, isn't it? Mm. That you're thinking, where's my future? Well, like, I... 29% of that survey said, I don't think I can afford to start a family. Yeah. And there's a couple of things that I think you see. I mean, I, I was listening to a man give a talk on the economic situation that we're in, and one of the things that he said was that um, you see inequities and uh, unfairnesses develop and resentments develop. So let's say you and I are living side by side at the moment. If I have a tracker mortgage on my house, I'll probably be paying, let's say, €1,200. Euro. For the exact same property if you're renting, you'll be paying €2,500 mm. by pure chance. That means that I have the opportunity to spend a grand and a half a More. month on yeah. childcare, mm -hmm. on evenings out, yeah. whatever I want, yeah. compared to you not being able to... Those kind of inequities in society... They don't go down well and they don't last well. And there have been people waiting, kind of going, OK, there is going to be some form of a downturn. Not that we're praying for that in any way, shape or form, but I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold oh, off. Yeah, I'm going totally. to hold off on the house. Mm. And the next thing, sorry, I'm one of those people. The next thing's like, no, don't bother. You know, no, take the, anything you can get. The form of the downturn, of course, is going to be what part of the problem is because where yeah. we have to get to is a real recession, whether it shows up because of the way our GDP works and the figures are not. But where we are heading to, almost without question, is a recession. So that at the point at which house prices prices might start to soften. At the same time, incomes soften and your capacity mm. to buy them. So you keep getting caught yeah. in this set of catch-22s. It does feel like this is going on I, 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 Forever. continually and it has been like this for 15 years and something does need to be done. We'd love to hear from you this morning. As always, we want uh, your opinions. It's so yeah. cheery. Please cheer us up. It's 0896 111 If you know someone who's thinking about emigrating, just for like, sure, like nurses I know in Australia, it's just a better quality of life. Even though it's incredibly expensive to live in Australia, they still have be better take-home pay. So we'd love to hear from you on that one and buying houses, all that kind of stuff. Now, let's move on to something that I would say you and I may not care about. You, I think you do. We were sitting Are in makeup this? this morning and Mar um, Miriam was saying, she said, I couldn't care less. I just, <laughs> just leave him alone. Uh, but uh, Harry and Meghan, the Netflix documentary. Will we, ta yeah. will we take, let's a, a, let's take a look at the documentary? You've all heard about it. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. The pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. No one knows the full truth. We know the full truth. Dun, dun, dun. I, I will be glued to that. I will I think be glued you and, to that. You and, you and, and the millions mother, others. You know yeah. what I mean? So this is, it's here. 
the Netflix yeah, this, documentary that's been promised for a few years. This is the, the latest um, step in a series of attempts by Meghan and, and Harry that so far have seemed to fail. If you remember at the outset, they, they went on Oprah and they said... Oh, what? come on, yeah, go on. Yeah, come on. Well, they've made an appeal for their privacy and they said, we just want everybody to leave them alone. <laughs> but we're going to do books and documentaries. Well, no, they, they, they said it on Oprah <laughs> and then, weirdly, nobody left them alone. So they thought, well, OK, we started a Spotify series. So Meghan did her Spotify series, <laughs> saying, leave me alone, will you stop looking at me? And people kept looking at her. So then they did a book. You pop. It's true, he did a book saying, leave me alone, stop giving me all this attention. And that didn't work either. So now they've got a Netflix documentary saying, leave us alone, stop giving us all this attention. It is likely, one assumes, to be an absolute gold mine for Netflix, they're going to make a fortune. Because if you remember um, Howard Stern, the shock jock in mm -hmm. the States, there's a famous scene in his movie and in his book, Private Parts, okay. where they do the original research into him on WNBC. And they say what the research shows is that half of his listeners hate him. And management said, all the more reason to get him off. And they said, no, they're the ones who listen, listen most. most. Mm -hmm. And that's what will happen with this. People who loathe Harry and Meghan will be glued to it. Piers Morgan won't be Piers able to Piers Morgan look away. is doing some of the, the voiceovers on well, it. Well, no, no, he's not doing a voiceover. Is he's he taken a clip oh, from okay. Piers Morgan All speaking right. All right, about I thought I heard for yeah. Meghan. But now, in and fairness, in the clip. Oh, yeah? I, I have to say, no. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the assistant commissioner of the Met last week when he was retiring did an interview for Channel 4 and he said there was credible, really high security risks on Meghan that they took very seriously. A number of times they felt that her life was very much in danger. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah like, I mean, and they, the... like so... And, like, serious threats to her life. Yeah, I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. That may absolutely mm. be the case. I would suspect if you go through the royals, if you go through anybody who's in public eye, the same yeah. will be true. I know a number of people who wouldn't fit in the category of major celebrities in Ireland. But he said more, more so than threats. any other member of the royal family, she was targeted solely, like... like um, and. Over a, over a period of time, they had a number of serious threats on her life. Yeah, it wouldn't. Again, the two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, and particularly when you you portray somebody as the villain, where yeah. she has very much yeah. been portrayed mm -hmm. as the villain. I mean, we said jokingly about Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan has been shouting about her being responsible for all the ills of society <laughs> for a long time. But that doesn't change the fact that they have managed very successfully to monetize their fame. Oh, which, yeah. they which they have, they have, have to. to. They've got to make a pretty penny. Yeah. What can Harry do? He's, he's only, he, doesn't, he doesn't get security like anymore. Do he has to pay for security. He has to buy his house. He has to mind the kids. Do you know what Harry did for a while? Do you know what William used to do? William used to fly Coast Guard helicopters. Put on a little helmet, put on goggles. Nobody knew who he was, <laughs> flew a helicopter. There's nothing stopping Harry getting a job flying helicopters in LA. He could fly a traffic report helicopter every morning. Now go away. I'm, I'm, so, you know, I'm so silly. Do, I'm and so you know silly. What? You're getting a job <laughs> like because the rest of us. Because the paparazzi are never going to leave them alone. They're because never they keep going, going up to the alone. paparazzi and saying, hello, leave They're me alone. They're never going to leave them alone. Okay. They're never going to leave them alone. Well, how can we leave Daniel Day-Lewis alone? Because he keeps his head down, that's why. Daniel, how do you feel about this? You've got to play <laughs> Harry in the film. We'd love to hear from you. Are you going to be we watching the Netflix series when it comes out on Thursday? Everyone's going to be watching it. I'd say, you know, restaurants, everyone's cancelling. Going to watch the Netflix documentary. Anton, uh, always a pleasure. Thanks, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, coming up next, five-time All-Ireland winning GAA star Noel Healy talks retirement with you. Now, wait for this for an overachiever. I swear it's going to make you go, right, what have I done with my life? With five All-Irelands and four All-Stars under her belt, Noelle Healy has had a remarkable career with the Dublin women. She also went off and became a doctor whilst she was at it. Noelle, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, not too bad. There's so much like that you have managed to fit into your life and that takes so much dedication. But in a, in a football career where Dublin really emerged, like as such a strong and powerful team. Is there a highlight for you that really makes you go, yeah, yeah, that that's, that was the pinnacle? Yeah, um, I suppose finally winning the All-Ireland in 2017 um, for me was kind of one of the highlights. We'd just come off the back of losing three All-Irelands, obviously to an, an amazing Cork team. Um, I'd been the captain the year before and we lost. And I think there was a lot of soul searching that we would have done coming at the end of that championship, just seeing, asking ourselves, you know, were we even really good enough to, to actually win an All-Ireland um, as a group together? There would have been a few of us that would have been around in 2010 when Dublin kind of finally made that breakthrough. Yeah. But um, yeah, to finally, I suppose, get that monkey off your back and, and to, to win it with, you know, a lot of your best friends was brilliant. Weren't you player of the year, player of the match as well? Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah that's, that's going to yeah. be up there it's as well, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very nice. <laughs> um, when it comes to 
the state of women's football, it's in pretty fine fettle. Like in the last decade, when the rivalry started yourself, Dublin, Cork, Mead, everyone kind of getting into it. It's been fantastic to watch. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Um, I think when probably people are getting a bit sick, maybe of the Cork-Dublin story, you know, you have a, a team like Mead to come literally rip up the script. You know, you're expecting Cork to come again, maybe someone like Galway, and they were like, nope, we'll take it. It's our opportunity. And they're brilliant. You know, such a brilliant story, some great characters um, and some brilliant footballers as well. So yeah, it's really, it's brilliant. It's so exciting. It's such a brilliant time to be a part of it and to kind of seen that evolution of it as well, of the kind of strength and conditioning, the funding that goes into it, the advertisement, yeah. the exposure has been brilliant. And it, it does sort of, that is the excitement about sport when a team can come from absolutely nowhere and be like, hold on, you're competing against Dublin and but is it, when it like the game itself has really stepped up itself for women in the last 10 years is in the funding that has been involved and you've put yourself to the fore with whether it's corporate sponsorship and really going for it that you've put yourself on the map on the map in such an amazing way because the, the talent was always there yeah absolutely and then I suppose you know the talent was there so we got a bit of um recognition um mm. and some coverage from that but then I suppose the onus on us was that to continue to kind of keep that quality there which was always kind of something that was put on our backs as well to you know you want exposure but you also want bums on seats so give them a spectacle so we kind of felt when other teams are you know men's teams are probably going to the less attractive form of football that we had a really fast paced exciting game that you know was really good to market you did it that's it I was like it was I'm sorry but like when it happened with the Donegal teams just getting really boring and it's like Okay, what's that? The women just stepped forward and it was so exciting. I remember my dad being like, I'm not watching a man's match ever again. Like, it was just so good. But during all of this and everything that you achieved, you're becoming an anesthesiologist in the background. And that is a very, very demanding career when you're going through the junior doctorship and everything. How, like, you must have had no free time. Um, yeah, I had no social life. You're like, you mustn't. <laughs> no, yeah, I suppose uh, it was tough. I suppose the, f the first thing was that I really liked doing the two of them. I think that's the most important thing. Like, if you're going to be spending that much time doing it, you have to want to do it. So, yeah, like, I love playing football. And then I found a career that I found really exciting. I had brilliant colleagues. I loved the different people that we'd meet every day. Um, you know, people slag Anisis for saying, oh, you must not like your patients because you put them asleep and you don't have to talk to them. But <laughs> I, like, I love that encounter that we have with them just before they go to sleep you know it's somebody who's at their most vulnerable they're their most nervous and it's kind of those really nice interactions that you have um so yeah I just really enjoyed the two of them so it's happy you've spent your time doing something so it's but cool. oh yeah you gotta say I suppose yeah I sit down and watch Buffy do you know what I mean but if you're like I never thought about that before that moment that you have when you're putting someone under mm. is it like does it get a bit deep and meaningful and because people are, are trusting you to make sure that you bring them back yeah you've you know they put on a big brave face and they go in and all of a sudden you know they come into the theater into the anesthetic room and you do see you know the big burly guys but all the tattoos suddenly be like I'm actually a little bit afraid of needles and you know like it's it's nice they're very nice interactions and like our job is safety we you know our, that's our main thing is to bring yeah. people safely through and that's kind of what we try to re-emphasize that look this we're going to look after you and that's kind of the last thing that I always say as well and you did announce your retirement last year was that very difficult or was it like I'm done now no I was ready yeah yeah definitely yeah I think speaking to a few people I know if I suppose we hadn't been as lucky to be successful as we were maybe there would have been a few question marks or kind of a few what ifs or regrets but um I was really happy obviously with everything that we'd achieved and I was kind of just ready I think COVID probably gave a little bit of an, an insight or a window to kind of what your free evenings could be um so yeah I was ready to just take a little break and I suppose be a little bit more selfish with your time in terms yeah. of, you know, make, being able to make decisions about what you intend to do on the weekends, but also being a bit less selfish and being able to give your time to, you know, your partner, your parents, family, you know, friends, being able to actually turn up to weddings and spend the whole time at it, not, you know, leaving after a meal or, yeah. you know, missing, missing a ceremony because you have a challenge match and things like that. So, yeah. It must be nice to do that. You also then, you didn't really rest on your laurels. You went with Trocra. To, and you're involved in their one of their Christmas appeals. You were over in uh, Lebanon. Yeah, so um, in a uh, refugee just a few camp. Weeks ago. Yeah, so we so there's um, after obviously the Syrian war, there was 6.6 .6 million Syrians who had to flee. Um, 1.5 of them are in Lebanon at the moment, so they've the the most amount of refugees in the world there currently. Um, so we went to visit two refugee camps in the Beka Valley in in, in Lebanon, which is a valley in between two um, two mountains so that the climate is a little bit different there. Um, it, it can drop very, very cold in the winters. Last year it went to about minus 10 degrees. The, you know, you can see some of the camps that, that we went to visit, the the kind of the laws are that they can't be made of anything other than tarpaulin. All they can be is, is three 
um, cement blocks high. So you've, you know, you've wind, you've rain, you've got snow. Um, and obviously, you know, in terms of, of keeping in heat, they're, they're not they're not built for that. So yeah, yeah it's really challenging um, for the people there. So we went um, with Trokra and who are working with um, partner organizations there, Sawa, who are helping to just give support, you know, not just financial, but also, you know, social, psychological um, support to the, to the people that are there. Yeah, like you're in, there's sanitary issues as well. Obviously, you're in a massive refugee camp as well. And I know that it's hard at this time of year. Like there's so many things going on here at home and all around the world. But as always, Trokra are doing their Christmas appeal. And if people want to get involved, it is trokra.org. Uh, so it's Trokra's Christmas campaign and people can find out more there. Yep. And it's just something that people... Yeah, I'd say it was pretty stark, was it? Yeah, it, it was. It was tough. I mean, I think going in, they did prepare us. You know, they told us what the conditions would be like. But... I think speaking to people, a lot of the time, it's very easy to distance yourself when you hear the stories on the news and you kind of, you know, of you don't you see them. But then you, you talk to them and they just, they have the exact same beliefs and wishes that we have. You know, all they want to do is provide education to their kids, be able to earn a living, to provide for their family and keep their families warm, yeah. you know. God, humanity, you get worried about it. Listen, Noel Healy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh -huh. We really do appreciate it. We'll be back with you on Ireland AM very shortly. Ireland AM have teamed up with Tesco, who are standing up for joy this Christmas. Not only do they want to help customers have a joyful and affordable Christmas, but they're also helping to make entertaining super easy with their range of pre-prepared party food that all cook at the same temperature. The full range will be in store from December 12th with everything from chicken tikka samosa to truffle mac and cheese bites and tempura prawns to Tesco plant chef no mozzarella sticks. There's something for all tastes and dietary requirements, including gluten-free, vegetarian and vegan options. Together with Tesco, we're giving you the chance to win a €1,000 shopping voucher to spend in-store to help with your big Christmas shop and beyond. For your chance to win, just tell us, chicken tikka originated in what country? Is it A, India or B, England? To enter, call 1550 999 318 or text SHOP to 57199. Now we're going to take a look at today's newspapers. We'll start with the Irish Times. House prices set to rise despite slowdown in market. A major lobby group has warned that structural issues are set to keep pushing demand for homes higher despite the recent slowdown in the property market. Population growing at three times the rate of home supply. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Population growth far in excess of new housing, creating pent-up demand that won't be relieved until supply increases substantially, according to a new banking report. The Examiner leads with Healthy Ireland. We drink more, but we smoke less. The report finds that we're drinking more, but smoking less, possibly getting fatter, and some of us are struggling to afford basic healthcare products, such as tampons. The mirror goes with minus seven killer chiller. Ireland is bracing itself for minus seven degrees Celsius temperatures with Med Erin saying the icy blast could last until next week. And that same story is on the front of the star. The headline, you'll catch your debt. Elderly people are being urged to keep the heating on and not to worry about the bills ahead of the cold snap. Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. The Sun's front page reads, Dowdall wife I feared hit. Jonathan Dowdall's wife was afraid he'd be killed for speaking to Gardaí about the Regency hit a court has heard. The Herald's front page, gangsters on CCTV with bag after Keane murder. A Drogheda criminal and Dublin hitman were spotted near the Keane Mulready Woods murder scene with a sports bag after the teenager's killing. And finally, half of under 30s are thinking of emigrating is the top story of the Daily Mail. More than half of young people under 30 say they would consider leaving the country due to the spiring living costs here. And just talking about that, lots of texts coming in. People like Stephanie's here. She's going, I'm a 30-year-old with one child and currently can't buy a house because they're too expensive. Despite the fact that myself and my partner work full time, I completely understand why people want to emigrate. This country is so backwards sometimes and things need to change. And Alva says, I emigrated to Australia in 2011. I returned home in 2015. I'm now a young mother living in the west of Ireland. Like many other mothers, I want to return to work to a career that I love love and worked hard to build, but I can't afford to because my childcare fees 
would be unaffordable. I'm not surprised young people want to emigrate. And she yeah. is one of those young people with a shadow of a doubt. And keep those messages coming in. Now, I did... Um, well, Edward Hayden nearly had a, a mini-stroke earlier on he because did. I said about putting up trees in December. Well, no, or, you put them well, up in early, November. Well, I put it up in November. Edward wouldn't do it because um, he says it's way too early. When do you put it up, Edward? Um, about the 12th. The 13th. 12th. That's the 13th. And then he puts a little bit of that. Uh, I like this. I don't know if I've done this before. Seven up. But a seven up in the base of the tree, the glucose, the sugar, it all keeps yeah. going. And then, of course, Alan has to throw out there, because I would do this every day for three hours a day if I could. Look at your Christmas trees. <laughs> That would be amazing. I don't have mine up. So, Frances, yeah. she says that we put up our tree early every single... Oh, Fran, look oh, at that Oh, I love window. that, Frances. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, Liking that. I like that picture as well. Yeah, I that's love that That's nicely picture. decorated. Now, the Foley Christmas tree... Now, this no, that's is the our... same one now. Oh, is that the Foley Christmas tree? I don't know which Oops. one is one. One of them Frances, is Frances. That was Frances. And... Number two is the Foley Christmas tree. Listen to this, lads. Now, Edward, up since November 19th. Uh, <laughs> oh my god can we just do christmas crack with edward hayden where he's like yes edward's no. over there love it can like, we, that look at him a... he's like an old biddy in the corner going i would just stop that now <laughs> but we just stop that can we could we get him to judge christmas trees wouldn't that be an amazing segment Love it, hate okay, it, too Sharon, much tinsel. Sharon says this is our Christmas tree up since the fir first of November. Edward, <laughs> steady on, steady on, Edward. Up since the first of November. I would have put it up earlier if it wasn't for Halloween. <laughs> that's oh, a, that's we, a beautiful it's tree. It's been a tough year, Edward. Maraid says we put up our tree for the toy show every single year. I love the coloured lights, Maraid. Thank you for giving me the coloured lights. Coloured beautiful. lights, yeah, we don't see... And a lot of coloured lights. So we don't keep sending your pictures of your Christmas trees. We'd love to see them. We'll ask Edward and uh, maybe to judge it. Maybe Edward will give you a little prize for the best tree. No, he absolutely <laughs> won't because it's too early. He's like, disgusted at everyone in the country who's got their Christmas tree up, including us, because we've got 27 <laughs> trees around the studio. Um, 087, uh, 89, 6, triple one, triple one. Now, up next, the producer behind the acclaimed Quinn Country documentary shares the inside story on bus businessman Sean Quinn. We'll talk to you shortly. Staying with us now, our next guest is an Emmy-nominated producer and author of a new book detailing the rise and the fall of former billionaire Sean Quinn. We could talk to him about so many things, but we're going to stick with, I think, Quinn today. Trevor Bernie, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Obviously, you had the documentary Quinn Country, which the whole country was fascinated with, and now you've got the accompanying book, which gives so much detail. Trevor, how in God's name did you get Sean Quinn to talk to you? Well, uh, it's a good question. It's, uh, it actually all began way back in 2018. Uh, I'd worked on another documentary which had caused a little bit of trouble in the North where, uh, called No Stone Unturned, which was all about collusion and attack, which killed uh, six Catholics in, in 1994. And I actually ended up getting arrested for that documentary. And after that, I was kind of looking for a new project. And a friend of mine and former colleague uh, down in Fermanagh said, you know, do you want to meet Sean Quinn? And uh, we were walking uh, in Belfast at the time, it was about September 2018, and with a month later I met Sean Quinn, and a month after that I began to interview him in, in November 2018. And I think at that stage Sean Quinn had a motivation. He could have sort of felt that he wanted the, to tell a story in the court of public opinion. He really wanted to get a story out there, he wanted to tell his truth, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Now, just for people who may be tuning in this morning who don't know the story, can you briefly just give us a synopsis of the story of Sean Quinn? Yeah, it actually all began in December 1967 in many ways with the death of his father. Uh, his father had owned 26 acres of pretty hard land just on the border and had farmed it uh, and, and, and it provided for Sean and his uh, brother and sisters. And uh, that Christmas, his father died suddenly and Sean Quinn had a decision to make. Uh, he had left school uh, as an 11-year-old. He uh, had stayed at home, as he said, to be the dunce who milked the cows. <laughs> and then after, after his father's death, he decided, am I going to farm this or am I going to do something different? And he decided then, rather than to farm the land, to dig down into the shale, which was very rich in that part of the world, Others around him had already started quarrying and Sean Quinn became a quarryman and from 1973 for 30 years 
everything he touched turned to gold from a quarry he bought pubs he built hotels he bought property all over Europe and he built an incredible industrial complex right on the border a plastics factory a, a roof tile factory a manufacturing company two cement factories like just incredible employing thousands I was of going people. to say that people really admired him because he was giving employment to these border counties which would, would have been derelict he was a one man industrial yeah. development board no doubt about it <laughs> and you know whatever happens whatever happens to Sean Quinn and wherever the story goes from now it can't be forgotten that it was because of his vision and his tenacity that created those thousands to jobs mm. right on the border there. Yeah. That's all down to one man, and that's all down to Sean Quinn. And it is at any any surprise that there was so much support for him, and there was so much sympathy for him at the time, because you know, yet a mother and father, and maybe children, all employed at Sean Quinn, all yeah. who were able to stay there on the border, all be employed, not just in jobs, but very mm. good jobs, mm. careers in an area that there simply was an economic wasteland yes. up until Sean Quinn yeah. decided to dig down into that shield. And that's the thing, he was he was one of us, the boy done good. So people, this cult of personality was very much created, I think all around the country, but certainly on the border in, in Fermanagh. But can you tell us about Cheltenham in 2004? In, it, it, in, in 2004. 2004. Well, by 2004, Sean Quinn was certainly on paper a billionaire. And, uh, but he'd never really ever uh, um, engaged with the trappings of wealth. You know, this wasn't someone who, uh, um, you know, despite being incredibly wealthy, this isn't someone who had a second home in the south of France. He didn't have a home in Dublin. He, <coughs> he, had, a, he had a very good home on the border. Yes. You know, and he, and he enjoyed everything that came with the success. But he really uh, uh, didn't really engage with success in the way that we now know and we see it yeah. whenever we look around. He goes to Cheltenham 2004 and Dermot Desmond is there, another hugely successful businessman. And whatever happens over the course of those five days, um, Sean Quinn ends up buying a factory called Barlow Radiators on the flip of a coin from Dermot Desmond. And he comes back and, 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 and whatever he'd seen with, uh, at Cheltenham, he decided and he told the people in his boardroom, Let's get a jet. And from that moment, Sean Quinn began so the process of the So then it did start the, the whole thing, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Something changed in around 2004. Now, let's, let's face it, it was the Celtic Tiger was roaring yes, at the time. Yeah. Everyone was uh, uh, drinking it in. Everybody was enjoying excess, absolutely. And Sean Quinn then tilted into to that. And at that stage, unbeknownst to anybody, he was beginning to build up a share in Anglo-Irish Bank. He looked at Anglo-Irish Bank, he saw something that mirrored him, you know, a startup bank, someone was taking on the big mm. boys, somebody was taking on the establishment figures, and Sean Quinn got the jet and he began to build up this uh, and, th share. and this is what ruined him, the Anglo-Irish, uh, like the buying and buying and buying the shares, even when they were going down, he was convinced he was still going to make profits on it. Well, there had been there had been a time. This wasn't the first time he dabbled in yeah. shares. Actually, back in the, in the early noughties, at the time of the dot com boom, you remember the dot com mm -hmm. boom where everyone's saying it's all about tech, it's all about these yeah. dot com, and there was a huge spike in the price of shares in the late nineties. Sean Quinn, who had set up Quinn Insurance yeah. just a few years before, was in charge of the uh, um, of the investment strategy for the insurance company, and he bet very heavy on the uh, uh, dot com shares, and he believe whenever they started to fall actually they were becoming much more attractive because they were falling he thought they would just rise again of course he didn't mm. there was a dot-com crash and he lost millions at that stage he he he, he should have learned this lesson yeah really but actually, just a few years later, he began to do the same thing again. He was very well divested. He was buying shares in Ryanair and other blue chip companies, but he cashed those all in and went down the rabbit hole that was Anglo Irish, Anglo -Irish Bank. Bank. And at one stage, previous in the early noughties, he did have a parachute in the form of an unnamed uh, government source who, who protected him. Well, yeah, he, 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 you know, the word is at that stage that, you know, the regulator was looking at putting. Quinn direct into administration. Yeah, it was years, under years before. This yeah. is years, this is 2000, so this is eight years before the economic crash of 2008. But Sean Quinn was able to go meet a very senior uh, government uh, figure yeah. mm -hmm. and the threat disappeared. Now, you've got to ask yourself, did, that, did he learn the lesson of that? Or was the lesson he learned that no matter what trouble he would get into, get he was going to be able to lift the phone yeah. and be able to get out of it? And maybe then, in 2008, 
the wind had changed, we were all suffering from an economic yeah, crash. Yeah. No government figure was going to be able to save him at that stage. But Sean Quinn, I think, actually believed that at some point the government would come in, they didn't want to see the loose, loss yeah. of jobs, and only him, in a kind of a Trumpian style, only Sean Quinn could s sort it all out. Nobody else could sort it but out. It, and government would see that and yeah. come to his rescue. But of course, but it, it didn't happen. Two billion he lost. Well, did he lose he, two billion? He, 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 ultimately, his gamble uh, and, the, and, the, and the monies that were lent him meant that he lent he, he owed the Irish taxpayer two point four billion. Two point four. But there billion. was another one point two billion that actually owned a group of uh, banks in the U in the US, which then in the month the debt ended up in bondholders. So he ended up owing almost four billion. That's how much <sighs> he lost. Can we can we get into because there's so much in this and the book is. The way it, it's a thriller, like it, it's amazing to read this book. But we have to talk about Kevin Lunny, a name that we all know yeah. now, who had been very close with Sean Quinn, and then of course when Alan Jukes and the firm went in to to take over um, control of Quinn Insurance, then uh, Kevin Lunny was at one stage who was trying to recapitalise and keep everything going. He was taken and he was abducted, and he was tortured. We all know what happened. It's horrific. You you talk. To Sean Quinn about that? I did, yeah. I mean, we began interviewing Sean Quinn a year before. That uh, happened. Before that happened, you yeah. know, and at that stage, Sean Quinn was really looking, his, his, he was training all his anger was, was on Dublin, what Dublin had done to him, what the government had done to him, what the establishment had done to him, what the regulator had done to him, what the banks had done to him. It really was, we began to talk to him, his whole focus was on Dublin, what they had done and taken away as companies, what Alan Jukes had done to him. So by, by, by September 2019, when reports began to come through of, of, of Kevin Lunny's attack uh, and abduction, uh, it was shocking, and it was shocking. And, and, and we took the, the first opportunity to go down and see Sean Quinn. And it's quite clear at that stage Sean Quinn was in something of a state of shock. OK. There's no doubt about it, he was in a state of shock. And much of that was to do with the actual public reaction as well. He knew for the first time in his life that people were crossing the street who didn't want to, who wanted to avoid him, who didn't want to speak to him anymore. And he felt that he knew no matter what his guilt or association or not anything any, mm. yeah. anything to do yeah. with this and he's yeah. always denied absolutely having anything to do with this he knew that in the court of public opinion there was a very much a huge unease in the cavern leitrim fermanagh area there was no doubt about it that people were deeply deeply upset deeply deeply shocked at what happened to kevin lonnie when the full details come out and that changed that changed everything. Yeah. Sean Quinn knew it changed everything. It changed the whole mood in the area. There was huge outpouring of sympathy and support for Kevin Lunny and his family. Yeah. Totally understandably. And I think that really, really changed everything. Changed the story. Changed the story we were telling. And Sean Quinn knew that. I mean, but I can't... Like, going in there talking to him about it, the whole country is talking about it. It's horrific. But also because there were the Molly Maguires. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about the Molly Maguires really quickly? Like, we can yeah, talk I'm, about this all I know. That I, was, I just wanted to get to the Molly Maguires because it's fascinating. Well, listen, in 2011, Sean Quinn's companies were taken off and, you know, Alan Duke sent uh, a team of security guards up, and, up, to, up, up to the north and seized his companies and, and were liquidating the companies then. Up in the up on Dune Mountain, above yeah. all those factories, uh, a group of uh, people got together on a regular basis to plan attacks. And those attacks were designed to do two things, to drive down the value of those companies, yeah. but also to put off anybody from daring to come into Quinn country to take Sean Quinn's factories home. And from 2011 to 2014, they absolutely succeeded, with the attacks culminating in, 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 in a vicious series of attacks over weekend, one weekend against uh, another businessman called Kevin Lagan who lost over 1.2 million or cost 1.2 million in damage in, 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 in fire attacks on his factories in Lisbon, Cumber and Cork all in one weekend. After that, nobody would touch Quinn's businesses. That's what it's, happened. It's just fascinating. And then, like, and still living in the mansion with the wife? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, listen, it's, it's him and Patricia there yeah. and uh, that's their home. That's the home they yeah. built. And, you know, and I think that uh, uh, anyone who understands anything about bankruptcy bankruptcy she understand that really whenever that goes through that process your home person who's been like bankrupt can be made homeless but also there is also uh, a desire to try to leave them as some sort yeah, of dignity yeah. and i think that's what happened with sean quinn trevor <laughs> there is the book quinn. it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating and good luck at christmas at home in, Fer in fermanagh when you bump into him <laughs> on the street it's been a pleasure talking to you trevor thank Lovely. you so thank you so, so much, much.
if you're feeling fancy this festive season, you're going to be feeling fancy this festive season. Always. Edward Hayden has a posh prawn cocktail starter. Good morning, Edward. It's one of the quintessential Christmas starters, isn't it? That whole notion of prawn cocktail. And people tend to have such traditions around Christmas food that we tend normally not to deviate too far from what we no. had the year before and the year before that. So, well, yeah. People are at home judging, going, now I wouldn't do that with mine, Edward. Yeah, you yeah know absolutely. That's what's happening. Yeah. Listen, I have invited them to judge me. <laughs> now, we're going to make a lovely garlic butter first of all so I've just got a couple of cloves of garlic there and I've just started to soften a little bit of butter and into that I've got a little bit of parsley and thyme. How many and cloves would you use? I've put two cloves into about three ounces you know 75 grams just to kind of make it but you can have it more or less garlicky as best suits yourself. Mm. Now the reason I'm doing these as well is these are going to be a gorgeous garnish for the actual prawn cocktail oh, but they'd be really nice to have just as little nibbles you know maybe before dinner as a little garlic bread. So what I've done is I've just got some bread and I've just sliced that into nice little thin pieces and I'm going to butter that, put it out onto my tray and that's going to go into the oven 180, 350 gas mark four for about six or eight uh, minutes just until they're nice and crisp and I'm going to serve those as a little garnish to the prawn cocktail. Lovely. Lovely. Now the prawn cocktail then I'm going to start with the sauce so this is slightly different than the norm so I have no brandy in it which often people would have brandy and they'd have ketchups. So I've got the mayonnaise I've just brought up some of my lovely sweet chilli jam I'm getting it ready for all of the edible Christmas presents for oh, my family. Oh I love that. Oh, that's um, a nice little idea. So just uh, garnish that up. In there some sweet chilli jam and I've also got a bit of lime and all the mojito makers will be familiar with rolling the lime just to get as much juice as you can out of it. It's a sweet chilli jam instead of the ketchup. Yeah, sweet chilli oh, jam no. instead of the ketchup. And as I, I said, I'm not putting in any brandy into it, which people would often do. Put brandy and, into the mayonnaise. Yeah, to the make kind of like a little Mary Rose sauce. Uh, and I've got a little bit of Tabasco as well, just to kind of wow. spice things up for Lovely. all your nearest and dearest at Christmas. So that's our sauce. And then it's literally just the assembly. So I've just said to people in the recipe, you can put you know, um, lettuce and shallots or scallions in there would be the traditional. What I've got, I've just got another few bits that you'd have around at Christmas. So I have a little bit of iceberg lettuce. I've got some red onion, which I finally diced. A little bit of cucumber. Yeah. We have all these things in the fridge at Christmas and they just add a nice uh, bit of colour. So I've just got some mixed peppers there as well. And of course, the few tomatoes. I'm just going to mix that up nicely. Now you could dress that if you want, but I tend just to dress it in the glass. So put in the iceberg, go find the iceberg first and then you'll go back and find all of the little bits and pieces that you've got in there just to try and build it with colour. Right. Now you might have rocket or spinach uh, mm. in there as well if you, uh, if you want it. But what that does as well, um, Alan, is it just gives a lovely bit of textural interest to your prawn cocktail. Now, I've now, never seen a prawn cocktail with onions and things like that in it. Yeah, as I said, you just kind of, this is a kind of a tweak on the classic. Yeah. It's just a variation on the classic. But it really is just to kind of add a little bit of colour and a little bit of texture to it. As I said, prawns in I absolutely am <laughs> going to put a mountain of prawns. This is going to be, okay. we're in, at Christmas, my cup just floweth over. Oh, okay. There we go. So in there, I'm going to put some of my my lovely cooked prawns on the top. Any specific prawns? Uh, no, you just I've got just these got, from your I've butcher? just got the nice little prawns here. I tend not to, I veer away from the larger tiger yeah. prawns oh, yeah. for this because you want them to be really nice just like that. Now, can I just say to you, if you had time, you could maybe put that into a lovely wrap or onto a lovely open piece of brown bread on brown Stephen's bread. day, you know, before you uh, head out for a little uh, nip of gin or something. So pop that up with some of the lovely dressing. So I've got my lovely little cruets oh. and then I'm just going to... Well, maybe I'm not. I feel it sliding away. So uh, I've got the lovely little cruets that you could put on with there. Would as you well. like a little cruet? I'll have a little cruet. Um, little cruet. Give her down a little cruet there. Here, fine. pop it down there. Take a pop of cruet. Thanks, me love. love a cruet. And then what I normally do, just to finish it off, is I'd put a small little oh, bit of waste, paprika. Waste. Uh, no, let her dig I'll in. Murder, let let her dig in. Uh, a little small bit of paprika on the top, or a little bit of cayenne pepper. But essentially, as I said, yeah. it's the lovely get a, prawn get cocktail. Get a little picture of that there. Look yeah. at that. Isn't it's the lovely prawn cocktail just like that. But Alan, also think about maybe taking a little bit of the garnish Think about taking a little prawn or two, even if you wanted to have it as a canopy. You know, when people arrive for dinner, oh, yeah. you could just mm. have a few of those ready. A little bit of paprika on the top, 
or, or a lot of paprika actually now gone on the top of that one and just have those on a platter oh, so that when people are yes. milling around and getting you to compliment their lovely frocks and their new Christmas <laughs> rig out and uh, they're sipping on the Prosecco, you could have some and of those And you feel so good on. because you're eating lettuce first thing in the morning yeah. instead of a celebration. Oh, Edward Head. Head. Always a pleasure. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Now, still to come after nine, we're going to be chatting to Love Actually star Martine McCutcheon. Plenty the other way after this quick break. Welcome back to Arda AM. It's our favourite part of the morning when we check in with Derek. Over to you, Derek. Yes, thank you very much, Myrna. Of course, we're live here at Chalk Nadini Family Resource Centre in County Monaghan, right across the morning. We're saying uh, good morning to uh, Jill Clark. Jill, you are the Children and Family Coordinator here in the centre. Tell us about your job. Yes. Thank you, Derek. Um, my, I suppose my job here, I'm the Child and Family Network Coordinator for County Monaghan, so uh, my job entails working with children and families. Um, I work very, very closely with children, um, coordinating meetings called MEHLs, which is very, very child-centred. So um, it's lovely to be based here in Shock Nadini, I suppose, for the community feel and to have such a buzz around with families in and out through the door. Now, what I love about this centre is it started off back in 1998, is that correct? Yeah. As a two-bedroom house mm -hmm, and it's grown mm -hmm, from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it originally um, was formed, I suppose, by a group of volunteers um, in a house which is now housing a Ukrainian family. Um, and we then opened the doors to this centre in 2005 and I suppose we've rapidly grown since then. Uh, we have so much going on here. We have myself, uh, the Child and Family Network Coordinator, we have family support, we have an aftercare worker, we have a social prescriber, we have the community development worker um, who works really closely with the Mullamac Tolvan community. Um, and yeah, we, we work with young and old, you know. Anyone yeah, I was going to say a lot of older members of the community members, yeah, as well. Yeah, so anyone who comes through the door, you know, um, they're welcome here. Any problem at all, no problems too small or too big for us. Uh, we're happy, you know, to help out whatever way we can. Now, we're trying to get all the, the hampers ready here this morning. Yeah. Cost of living crisis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're in the thick of it at the moment. Yeah. Pretty tough time for yeah. people, isn't it? Yeah, really tough time. So I suppose... Um, we are part, obviously, of the, the Tesco food cloud, um, and we also then receive shelf foods from um, the, the EU uh, feed pro programme. Um, and from that, we have created a food pantry uh, back in August, I suppose, to tackle the, the cost of living crisis that we knew that was going to come. Um, so we try and keep it as simple going as we can. Someone rings up, makes an appointment, gives us their, their initials. We don't ask any details other than their initials from them. Um, it's not our call to make if they're struggling or not. They come in through the door, uh, the receptionist welcomes them and we then show them to the pantry. Where and you also help them out with fuel as well. We help them with fuel as well if we can. Um, and yeah, then they leave through a side door, which which keeps it all very confidential yeah, so all discreet, for them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. what you want. Now, Lisa, pop over to me here. You're busy out this morning. You are a community champion with Tesco. A big wig around this neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm a community champion over 11 years, and uh, we have food appeal over the weekend. One of the most successful. Ever. Yeah, great success, yeah, wasn't it? Nationwide, but oh, also here in the country. Unbelievable, country's. unbelievable. And like here, we had the Chocolate Dean collected from Cavan store and Monaghan store, and they got 28 trolleys. As you can see, the amount of hampers we can make and really make a difference in the community. And I suppose in the run up to Christmas, these are the kind of goods that people donate. Absolutely. So loads of essentials and then lo some luxuries as well that everyone needs a little bit of luxuries and a bit of chocolate at Christmas. Yeah. So loads for the family. No stigma if anyone comes in here and, no, and, and gets a helping hand. And it's and they come in get their, and they get their name off jail and, and they go to their hamper and off a go. Nice and simple, nice and handy. And Rebecca, you're a social care worker here as well. Yes. What's your job in jail? I am a family support worker here, yes. So um, we work with a lot of families and children just in need. Um, so we're so busy this Christmas. Um, we have our food hampers going out um, and we've worked a lot with the community or with the Ukrainian community recently. Yeah, you have a local um, Ukrainian family living here. Yes, they're housed in our house. Um, so the language barrier has been, it's actually been fine. Um, we have a lady here who speaks um, Russian so she's been able to communicate with them. Communicate with her. And Jill, if people want to find out more, where can they find you? You can find us on Facebook, Chuck Nadini, um, and we also have an Instagram page as well. Okay. So we've loads going on, especially... So in the right across Christmas. your socials. Yeah, yeah. I'm very busy. And I believe you girls are sisters-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> You're married to her brother. <laughs> I to mind my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it in the family. Anyway, yeah. great work here in the ground in oh County gosh. Monaghan this morning. Be sure to check them out on their socials. But for now, back to you guys in the studio.
Well done. Thank you, Derek. Okay. It's just, just so simple. Just throw something into a trolley when you're from your own shopping. Absolutely. So yeah, it is. Yeah. And we all know that uh, so many, unfortunately, so many people in the country need, need it. it. So yeah. thank you for showing us that this morning, Derek. We really do appreciate it. Now, after nine, EastEnders and Love Actually star Martine McCutcheon. Yes. Have you, start, have you watched it yet, Love Actually? Not yet. This all right. Not this year? No. No, OK. No. OK, sorry. Die Hard Love Actually starts Christmas. Plus, Christmas Day glam looks and tips for the end of the year declutter. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back. Our next guest will definitely be gracing your screens this Christmas for her role in one of the most Christmassy movies of all times, Love Actually. Yes, Martine McCutcheon is joining us now. But before we chat, tis the season, let's take a clip. How far is this place? Just around the corner. All oh, right. Well, uh, I just wanted to say, um, thank you for the Christmas card. You're welcome. Look, I'm so sorry about that day. I mean, I came into the room and he sinked towards me and there was a fire and he's the president of the United States and nothing happened, I promise. And I just felt like such a fool because I think about you all the time, actually. And I think you're the man that I really love. Oh, wow. That really was just around the corner. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Hi, Marty McCoy. Eight is a lot of legs, David. Eight is a lot of legs, David. That's <laughs> one of my favourite lines of the whole film. <laughs> it's amazing. Every Marty, do you watch the film or are you like, no, I can't, I can't? I, no, I can't watch my bits. I've never been able... I can watch myself when I'm on set and I'm looking at a monitor and I'm being objective, like hitting my marks and making sure I've got the right light and all of that stuff. But, uh, no, once it's done, it's done. You, my mum, you can't tell her that because every Christmas without fail, she's all proud. She's like, babe, you're on the telly, come on! <laughs> oh, and I'm it. like, I make excuses and I run out into the kitchen and start working on the roast potatoes or something. But, um, no, I, I can't bear it. And I don't think I'm the only one. I think... Um, most of the actors and actresses, when we went to the premieres and we had to watch ourselves on the big screens, we were all squirming a bit. It's not normal, I don't think, to see I, yourself. It, like. It's amazing the amount of actors and actresses hate... Look, you don't like looking at yourself back no. on anything as well. I mean, <laughs> can you believe it's 20 years? No, I can't. I, you know, we were having a little chat, weren't we, a minute ago, and I can't believe that I've even been alive that long. <laughs> I mean, what is going on? Um, but, no, I can't believe it. I'm so proud of the phenomenon that it's become um, and it just snowballed. And, the, you know, with everything that's been happening in the world at the time, obviously, we had the Twin Towers and all, everything awful happening there. Yeah. And then since then, we've had the pandemic and lots of stuff happened to make us question things. I think it's so lovely that the fact that it's real and imperfectly perfect is why people keep coming back to it, because it gives you hope no matter what. And when you say imperfectly perfect, because people are keep on doing these re-evaluations of love, actually, um, what yeah. do you make of that? I mean, I get it, and I get... I know even Richard Curtis said, like, if you were to make it now, of course, you would do some things a little bit differently. Mm. Um, but I actually think part of its charm um, is the fact that it's honest, you know, it's not too perfect, too PC, and it's about people's vulnerabilities and real-life situations, and I think it's really endearing and sweet that... Natalie feels like she cares about the Prime Minister enough to talk about, for instance, her size or her weight or her her one of her one of her personal vulnerabilities. The fact that they show an imperfect affair that goes on between Alan Rickman and Emma Thompson, um, somebody in love with a, a married woman who have, you know who happens to be married to his best friend, you know, all those imperfections, all those things that don't tick the boxes. I think some of them. I, I think are part of what makes the film. Yeah, they certainly do. And of course, you had a lovely reunion with the cast there recently. Yeah, we did. We um, got to chat to the amazing Diane Sawyer, who's like a hero of mine, um, and uh, talk about you know the fact that we made the film. It was released next year, 20 years ago, but it, we were making it this time um, 20 years ago, and just reflect. And, yeah, can't believe it. Can't believe that um, it's become... None of us thought 
it would be the huge success mm. that it's become all these years later. And it is the start, that and Die Hard, the start of Christmas. You have what to is love, Die Hard love Christmas? Love Die Hard for Christmas. I, I, thank you. Well, do you love I Die do Hard at Christmas? thing for for Bruce Willis in his white vest and he gets dirtier and dirtier <laughs> and and you just sort of like can't stop watching I'm with you 100% <laughs> Nakatomi Plaza we gotta have it but wait I suppose people would be talking about I, I can imagine the lines that were quoted to you that are still quoted to you every single year and people going jump up jump up I'll catch you like the prime minister did like out at an airport but do you still get, like, do you get along? Because it was it's so special, that bubble that you were in. And people must always want to know, do you know, are you mates? Yeah, we do. We, we do. I mean, I still speak to Hugh, still see Hugh. I was invited recently to his birthday party, also to a, an award ceremony where he's given this amazing accolade. And I was sat at the table with Bill Nye. I did my press junket with Bill Nye. We did a radio play together. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, we had a chemistry, we had a bond, and um, he's looked out for me and championed me, Hugh, since day one. And my humour, I've got, you know, a bit of a wicked sense of humour, and so does Bill Nye, and we just get on like a house on fire. So, yeah, we're still definitely very much in touch. But, but... And Richard Curtis I'm in touch with as well, you know, him and his other half, they're in LA, and, yeah, it's good. Oh, it's lovely to hear that. And, of course, Martine, we can't um, have you here without talking about... And I always think the golden era of EastEnders, the golden time of Tiffany in EastEnders, I mean, it was such a special time. It was, it was when it was at its peak. I, I, I mean, I know that at the time, at peak viewing figures were about 22 million. Yeah. And there were obviously only like about five channels then. It sounds like we're talking about 100 years ago. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it was amazing. And you also obviously had Top of the Pops being filmed at the same time. So we would go and practice our lines after filming or, you know, have a chat and inward walk, Bono, you know, from you two, Cher, Diana Ross, <laughs> Liam Gallagher, who was a massive show, um, a fan of the show, should I say. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, an amazing time and they really they really kind of gave me that discipline because you have to film like 22 scenes a day it's still to this day out of theater eight shows a week you know filming movies music touring EastEnders for me was the hardest mm. schedule mm. I've ever ever done so hats off to them I don't know how the, the ones that do it for 10 years I don't know how they do it and also, you've got this double, because you left to kind of pursue your music career, you know, you released the album, and then there was, because it's like Perfect Moment was out, like you've got all these Christmas connections and all this kind of stuff. You've recently around, you're going, you're going back to music, and Jack McMahon is yes. your husband, uh, your singer-songwriter yes. husband, is he, uh, are you collaborating? Yeah, I mean, he's worked with everybody from Boyzone um, and Ronan to Ball and Bow, the Chainsmokers, people in Nashville. So I have to make the most of his talent and go, now you're mine. We did do an album a few years ago that did really well. Um, and we're going to do another one for sure because we've just moved. We've got the studio ready and I just feel like it's it's time. Um, but I'm also involved in this one for all Christmas campaign that I'm working on at the moment um, because it's all about basically Christmas is a time where it can be a bit of a strain as yeah. well as it being, you know, a great time for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the biggest arguments is that people aren't thoughtful with their Christmas presents. And um, I've had that with my husband. There was one year where we had a huge argument. Seriously, I I lost it. I got him the most amazing presents and he got me, I don't know where he went, he must have gone to a petrol station or something. <laughs> but I got windscreen wash, a pine tree air freshener, a pencil case. <laughs> Um, I don't know where he went. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> and so there's one less thing to worry about. My sister Lulu as well. We're going to get each other one for all gift cards and you can get them like at your post office, you can get them online at oneforall.ie um, and you can have them inscribed. And we're going to go out on Christmas Eve and have a glass of pink bubbles and buy each other exactly what, what we want. What you want so with, your, with your voucher. Can I just say such a profession with the plug? Well that done, so you got it in. You, you got, got it right in. in there. Yes. <laughs> can we just ask you, what is Christmas going to be like <laughs> at home? Is there any big plans? Um, 
Well, we've got we're, we're a lot of Irish in our family. Yeah. We're uh, Jack Spiders, Limerick, I'm Waterford and Longford. Um, and we, yeah, big Irish Christmas. We will be singing along. We'll be having a crack. The songs will be playing. Um, food, drink. My mum starts off as sous chef to Jack. And then as the pink gin goes on and on, she'll put the roast potatoes in and basically forget to tell him. Then then those little arguments start to go. And it's all about distraction, 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 happy distractions. And Rafferty, my little boy is seven. Yeah. And... He will be so, he already is, he's so excited this year. Gorgeous. And we know that we can all just say, Martin McCutcheon, eight is a lot of legs, David. Eight <laughs> is a lot of legs, David. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for chatting with us this morning. Happy Christmas. It's been a pleasure. Merry Christmas. Thank you. See you later. We're starting uh, to say it now to people. Happy lovely. Christmas. Happy love it. We're here. We are. Love her. Now, coming up next, Christmas Day styles to dress up and you feel fabulous on the big day. We'll talk to you very shortly. This week on Ireland AM, we've teamed up with Newbridge Silverware to give away a stunning canteen of cutlery. This much-loved Irish lifestyle brand has led the way in craft and design since 1934, and each year it continues to innovate and break boundaries with bold and creative designs. If you're looking for the perfect Christmas gift, Newbridge Silverware has a wide range of options from tableware, fabulous jewellery collections or ornate Christmas decorations. Together with Newbridge Silverware, we're giving you the chance to win a 124-piece canteen of silver-plated cutlery worth almost €2,000. The Antique Collection is distinguished by wonderful craftsmanship and detailed finishes, making it an ideal gift for those who appreciate the finer things in life. For your chance to win, just answer this question. When setting the table, for a meal, the forks should be placed on what side of the plate? A, the left, or B, the right? To enter, call 1515 999 333 or text WIN to 57199. I genuinely don't know the answer. The fork to that, is on I the have right. Them on the wrong side. No, the fork is on the right. We don't know. Don't trust it us. Is. The fork it. is on the right, the, the knife's on we the left. We can't give the answer oh. out. It's oh, a really sorry. hard competition. <laughs> I could be giving a wrong lunch. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Don't ignore me. <laughs> Google, because we're probably wrong. Now, it's only 19 days to Christmas and we're getting ideas on what to wear. I was like, what is yeah. he doing? St <laughs> Stylist Rob Condon's here to show us all the looks. Good morning Good to you, Rob. Good morning. Yes, we're taking a look at Christmas Day looks. We're all about glamorous outfits this morning to have you stylish. They're all available from Manor Mills Shopping Centre in Manute. Okay. Oh, lads, I basically wear my tracksuit. I'm looking forward to seeing how you're going to show me up here. Sarah Morrissey is our first look this morning. Well, if you're not someone who wears a tracksuit, it on Christmas Day, we have the most stylish and chic looks. We're all about this beautiful white coat and mixing sequence in this morning. A really classic and contemporary look for this Christmas. And in fairness, a lot of people do go visiting on Christmas Day exactly. and they go for dinner or they, like even going, like, I mean, a lot of people beside me, like the, the graveyard on Christmas Day, like everybody just... Getting dressed up to go to school. No, but you wouldn't be graveyard. getting dressed up in a coat. Do you to get dressed up to see Dad? <laughs> Dad, I'm getting dressed up to see you on Christmas Day. I knew, it, I knew the minute I said that, I shouldn't. <laughs> Beautiful coat hair for whatever the occasion on Christmas Day. It's available from Sorrento Boutique. A really classic piece to add to add to your autumn winter wardrobe. Underneath it, we have gone with a two-piece sequence combo hair. Now, we've gone really oversized with the shirt hair, um, and then we've gone with a slimline sequence skirt. With the shirt, though, if you wanted, if you didn't want to go with two sequences, you could definitely try this with a pair of leather. Oh, oh I jeans. love the oversized. Yeah, I think it works really well with it, tucking it into the skirt. So they're sold separate? They are sold as separate pieces, so you can mix and match them in your wardrobe if you didn't want to go with the combination. Like that skirt as well, with a woolly jumper, would go great for Christmas Day. Yeah. And the coat or with the oversized shirt, there's going to be so much you're going to be able to do with that, whether you mix it with a leather skirt or mix it with a pair of jeans. Yeah. Then we've added the boots here. They work really well with this look. I think it just brings the whole look together with the white coat with it. Now, with the boots, they are quite specific. You want to be going with a dress or a long skirt like this yeah. to wear those white boots. They're not going to go with everything. They're not going to be your winter boot, but definitely a stylish boot to add to your wardrobe. And then finishing it off with that necklace. It yeah. is gorgeous. That's like, a gorgeous yeah. outfit. I re for, a year, for about five years, I was like, I hate white boots. Look at me now. I, mean, I love, I love <laughs> And then them. you could wear it again on New Year's Eve. Yeah, exactly. You oh, could. You could wear it going to the 
graveyard. Exactly. It's going to get sparkles on. Sarah McGovern, hello. Yes, we're continuing here and we've gone with a classic Christmas look with that traditional red colour suitable for any um, occasion you'll have this Christmas day. With the jacket, it is 30 euro. This is a great piece to add to your wardrobe, especially if you're someone that wants to cover up your arms. It's gonna be a great piece even as you come into spring because it's that cover up piece, but it's a dressy piece as well. Um, we put it with the dress, which is a really statement piece underneath it. V neckline to this, it's from Divine Boutique. You can see the embellishment detail, which is at the, just above the bust there to it, matching back in at the waist. And you can see the ruche detail. So that's gonna be great for body shape. It's like a faux wrap dress, which is always great for body shape. Yeah. Button detail to it then. With the sleeves, it's matching back in with that embellishment. You've got the sheer bellowing sleeve to this and then that slit detail to it. I think it's a perfect dress for Christmas Day. Even if you wanted to make it a little bit more casual, you could go with a pair of boots with this, a pair of... Um, Boots would look great with, yeah, I think, a leather fabulous. jacket, change it around a little bit. We've gone with the shoes this morning, keeping it really dressy um, at 90 euro from Paul Byron Shoes. Blingy on the so earrings. Very, you know what I was just thinking there now? Say if you're, you've been slaving over the dinner and then some of your guests arrived and that, you'd be going, out here, give us a break. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> And, we track um, and then finishing it off with the earrings there. So we've kept it quite simple, just going with a statement pair of earrings. With the neckline, you don't want yeah. to be going with a necklace. But those earrings just finished off. Get really loads of well. wear out of that jacket. I yes. I'd wear that all of the time now. Uh, Blonde yeah, is our exactly. next look today. Yes, and we are all about sequins and satin with this look, keeping in with those traditional colours. We've gone Gorgeous with colours. forest greens. Yeah, starting off with the coat here. It is available from Dunn Store. So it's quite military vibes to this coat here. You can see the military style buttons to it. And I think with the look, it makes it really chic. It makes it sophisticated by adding that kind of really tailored Stunt. coat that to it. That's only 60 yes. euro. That is really good. It's fabulous. It. Yeah. It's also available in a camo color as well. Very then nice. Then underneath it, we've gone with the top at 20 euro. That's available from Carrie Dunn. So you can see the pussy bow to it. It's a bellowing sleeve to this as well. Really great top. Whether you want to throw it with a pair of jeans, whether you want to do it full on with the sequin skirt with this yeah. look. I think it's going to work with lots of different things in your wardrobe. This um, pencil skirt is available from Shade, so you can see lots of great Christmas colours. There's a purple tone to that as well, so if you didn't want to go with green on top, you could definitely match in purple. Slight slit detail to it as well. That's a really great nice. piece to add to your wardrobe. Um, if you want to make it a little bit more casual as well, you could go with like a logo tee underneath it and a leather jacket to make it that little bit more casual. And then finishing it off with the boots there. <coughs> so bringing in those green tones. They're an ankle pair of boots. What I like about them is they're a sock boot. They're quite tight on the ankle. So make sure if you're trying on boots, you don't want to have lots of room. Um, so okay, they will, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're quite tight and elasticated, so they're going to fit you properly. That you need to have that. Yes. You bring up the green tone in the earrings and then as bring well. The green tone exactly in the earrings there. So they are a hammered gold teardrop with green detail and earring. Blonde, that is that lovely yeah. on you. Green is your colour yeah, girl. That is and fantastic. Sarah is back with us now for our final yes, look. Yes, for our final look. So we've kept it quite classic and contemporary oh, in lovely. monochrome this morning with this look here. I love this. It's a simple top, but it's chic and effective. Um, from Sorrento Boutique, this whole look is. I love the sleeve detail to it. You can see the kind of ruch into the neckline of this. It just works so well. It's something that you're gonna have in your wardrobe each season. Loving trousers. the trousers, yes. they're fab. They're quite Victorian Beckham style. Where? Where? I'm I having love them. them. They are, they're beautiful pair of trousers. They're high-waisted. Nothing says Christmas like velvet, and these are definitely going to work with lots of different things in your and wardrobe. And wide leg on Yes, and you've got that 70s it, yeah. wide leg to these trousers. They're just an absolutely great piece to oh, add to Sarah, your Sarah, you look fab. That is so good on yeah. you. And the shoes. And then the shoes, so we've gone with a gold pair of shoes, which we've matched in with the accessories, and they are available from Paul Byron. They're slingback gold heel there. And there's a lovely bit of bling as well going yes, on Yes, accessory wise then we've gone with the drop earring, the really statement leaf motif earring there. But I think they're going to add to any outfit, oh, the yeah, black dress, perfect. they're going to make it stand out, those earrings. And then we've brought it back in in that gold necklace, the chain there, which is just adding another statement to this look. Oh, that's lovely. Now, you'd, yeah, if you're wearing that shirt, you're like, lads, I can't be doing the stuff. Yeah. I'm going to get ruined. <laughs> can't, I can't be doing anything. anything. I can't be doing anything. Stay away from that. Stay away, I'm watching stay love <laughs> and that's it. And just hand me one. And they're all available from with Manor that. Mills. We'll have white wine at the ready. Um, they're all available from Manor Mills in Maduth. Thank you so Thank you. much, Rob Condon. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, up next, Lovely. we're finding out what you need in your festive toolbox kit. That's a thing? Your a, thing. a festive toolbox. Festive toolbox. Everything you need to hand. 
I'm just so I'm so happy that you are not saying a word and he's finding it very, very, very difficult right now, are you? Nope. He's not even gonna read the next line. We'll see you after the break. You okay? <laughs> Welcome back. It's that time of year again. Time for the big Christmas declutter. Kim Fitzgerald from Assorted Affair, uh, Affair, Affair. Affair is showing us how it's done. <laughs> Alan isn't with us because you're talking about a Christmas toolbox and no one needs Alan Hughes and his innuendos in, in, in relation. We don't want to know what's in Alan's toolbox. <laughs> but all right, Alan, keep it to yourself. Oh, yes, you do. No <laughs> one wants to know. What's, what's a Christmas toolbox? Now, a Christmas toolbox is everything you need to hand. So everyone's toolbox will be different. Mine, oh, okay. mine is the bottle of Baileys, <laughs> the wine <laughs> opener, <laughs> because I'm done, I retire. Yes. I'm not wearing the white blouse, I'm wearing the tracksuit. You're there, yeah, you're I'm, there I'm ready to person, go. Yeah. So basically it's literally like a small box or a, a tub or whatever it is, a shoe box with yeah. your essentials. You know, someone pops over last minute, you might want a few cards to hand. Yes. You know, you, you want the bottle opener to hand, you might want the bin bags to hand. You're definitely going to want the batteries at hand the because batteries. Santa Claus doesn't always include them. No, he doesn't. So you want to make sure you're fully stocked. And now I brought my fancy battery organizer, but I mean, you don't have to go there. She has a battery <laughs> organizer. Of course she does. Of course I do. Of course but she does. you know, you want to make sure you've stocked up on all these things. You want your scissors, you want your tape, you want those, you know, those teeny tiny screwdrivers that you get in the, the crackers. They're yes. super handy because you're going to have that moment that morning and you're going to be like, oh, where's that? You know, Something where is that thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. so you want to just have it in a box, in a shoe box but just all together so you can just grab it. So go. great idea. So get that ready right now. Right now. Not start having building children. It. There yeah, we go. Just think That's of all the things that annoy me. you on Christmas morning. And you have a label box. maker. I do because you know I always have my label. You always have your label. It's you one never of know when someone needs a label. Someone needs to be labeled. <laughs> it's a label That's emergency. <laughs> now with the, we're looking here. I I always wrap my presents in newspaper. Yes, because it's seen that. recyclable. Which I just is fantastic. don't. When it comes to wrapping paper, some is recyclable and some isn't. Yes. How do you tell? There is a little test that yeah. you can do. So I have a one that is and one that isn't here. You do the scrunch test. Yeah. Okay. So you scrunch this one. Yeah. I'll show you now. Hang on. And you scrunch this one. You see the difference? Oh, that one stays. So this one's holding its shape, so you can recycle this one. And this one, and that it... one's not. It's like, Bleh. no, I'm done. So this one has to go into the main bin, unfortunately. So oh, think about it. So when I purchased this, I seen the recycle sign on it. You got to look closely. So it's usually like it was just the inner part that was able to be recycled. The outside, you know, not yet. It says. Sorry. So this bit is recycled. No, you know the brown bit, oh, like the, brown the inner bit. bit. So we could recycle that. So be be careful. Make sure you study. Yeah, this one's from pennies. And it was cheap and cheap. The cheerful little and pops. Yeah, recyclable. The pops. Anything so do you you can, the scrunch test. Anything you could do, because there's nothing worse than kind of, sit, like I stopped buying it's, it's a lot, uh, wrapping paper it? years ago. It's it is like, a lot. It's grand. So we just, So yeah. that's what, you just got to think about it and hopefully some of it will Absolute. be recyclable. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, one thing, Christmas cards. Christmas yes. cards. Old Christmas cards. We find them in everyone's house. Yes. Um, so a do we, when you're doing a declutter? Yeah, Christmas Are they always cards, there? Where okay. are the cards? I might like, just go. Anyway. Throw you know, them out. So I had to find new ones because I didn't have any old ones. Because you get demo. rid of them. <laughs> right. But a little use again, just to be kind of, you know, reuse and recycle is to turn your old Christmas cards into little tags. Oh. So the front of them is usually very pretty. So just cut them up, get the kids involved. Pop, pop a little hole and a little bit of twine or a little bit of string and there is at least they're kind of And that's what you can use going to use. And there was a survey, I think, from the University of Limerick today that shows that people who send Christmas cards are happier than people who don't. Oh, well, see, look, know. let's go put the stamps. The stamps? In the toolbox. In the toolbox. Because you are, can never find them when you need them. Stamps are very <laughs> expensive. Now, what's next? Should we talk toys? Because it's the time to do... Is now the time to do the declutter? Absolutely. Okay. You need to make room. Like, you need to make room. But then do you have to get the children involved or are you doing uh, it when they're asleep? Right, there's two options. You can fly solo yeah. and risk it. But if there's items that you're unsure of, we always suggest maybe pop them in the attic or somewhere out of sight and see if they go looking for them. Because they might, you know. And then you can just... And you can go, oh, look. Magically appears. I found it. Okay. And if not, if they're not looking for it and they haven't missed it, then get it straight to the charity shop. Or toy donations at the moment. The charity shops aren't great unless they're kind of boxed and new. But your local community crashes or community centres are brilliant and they're literally welcoming donations. They are looking. Yeah, yeah, they're looking for toy Absolutely. appeals right now. But we have a little traffic light system that we like to use when we do 
declutter with the children. So get post-its or stickers and you want a green, you want an orange and you want a red. Green is, I love it and I want to keep not it happening. and I haven't built it yet. Orange is, oh, I'm not sure, you know, I'll think about it. And red is like, no, don't like it anymore. It needs to Ready go. Ready to go. But you need okay. to make more space. Okay. Are we looking at lights? You can if you want. No, do I, would we look at the ironing <laughs> board? I think we should look at the Let's ironing board. Let's look at the board. ironing board, okay. So this is the only use, you know, one day. I <laughs> girl, I, I hear you. Or, I can't yeah, be bothered with I, the ironing I board. I don't do it, but I do pull it out when I do my wrapping because do you remember when you're, you know, you're sitting on the floor and then your legs go numb and then your back starts to And hurt. also you put, like you're kind of ruining the wrapping paper yeah, as well. Yeah, and it's all going all over the place. Whereas the ironing board is like literally the perfect place to do it. So you set yourself up with everything you need. Yeah, off you go. It's it's genuine. It's really it's actually a really good idea. It is. That's very handy. And I mean, there's room for a glass of wine down there, or a glass of Baileys, whatever it is. She knows what she needs to be doing with the Baileys. You can see what my theme is. For can we show you a, a picture that was going doing the rounds on Twitter? And this is um this is how someone has packed away their Christmas tree. I wonder if this would be something for you. Oh my god, I love. It. So they <laughs> wrapped it in cling film. I'm not saying it's sustainable or anything, but they kept it like that. All the decorations on it, and then just they cut, cut off the cream film, and it was ready to go. I mean, what do you think? That's genius. Is that if you Genius. have the space for it. Absolutely. Do we have the pop-up Christmas tree? Is I've, that there as well? I've seen one of these. What do you make of the pop-up Christmas trees? I think trees? they're quite genius as do well. Do you? Yeah, we actually seen one recently and it, it pops this way. It's very oh, fancy. Okay, so that's it. And pre-lit is the way to go, really, isn't it? Because who wants to get in a tangle with their Christmas lights? I'm just after seeing that you've yeah. put them in a Pringles Listen, box they've wrapped around. They've been in around. that Pringles box years and years. And someone bought me a really fancy Christmas light organiser and I still do it that way. People can find you on assortedfair.ie and also assortedfair on Instagram yes, as well. Man. Kim Fitzgerald, thank you so You're much. Very much. <laughs> Declutter away. Alan, my darling, how's your toolbox? Uh, doing well. <laughs> <laughs> What's on tomorrow's Coming show? Up on tomorrow's show, Bridgerton and Derry Girls star Jamie Beamish is going to be chatting to us. Ahead of the birth of his first child, former footballer Richie Sadler opens up about his fertility struggles. And everything you need to know about the icy snap and this year's top Google searches. Wonder what that is. We're in O'Connell. It's on top of everything. Join us live from seven tomorrow. What am I doing with this? What are you doing?